everybody, and welcome back to the Weird Science Comic Boom Indie a podcast. And I'm here with Rocky. What up, Rocky? Oh, man, it's a beautiful Sunday morning. It's Thanksgiving here in Canada, so I have a lot to be thankful for. So, yeah. Yes, it's, uh, yeah. yes the it. Canadian Thanksgiving. I was not aware. I ended up where somehow I didn't hear. Usually I always see that that is coming up, and so I did not realize. So we are recording earlier than we usually do, which it, it's not really that early, but it's still early for me. I am not a morning guy a- anymore because I usually don't go to bed until 5 a.m. <laughs> so when morning comes, it feels like it should still be night or I should be going to bed. I don't know. But we end up uh, continuing the spooky month of October here. We actually have a couple horror tinged books. It's funny because one of them actually keeps having reviews that it's like really horrific and i didn't think so i thought it was more of kind of a a cute little play there but it's neat it's a mike mignola book and then we also have dark ride by joshua williamson which will be good because me and you are a little down on joshua williamson right now maybe over at the dc and then we have a cool little teenage mutant ninja turtles book so we have three books i think will be pretty fun uh how about you 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 think we're gonna enjoy these do you have any sort of crystal ball of whether i will (laughs) like all of these because actually i'll just tell Uh, you i do like all these i think they're all pretty good well you should have let you should have let me guess because i would have guessed that you would have liked all of them uh uh, as well these these were all a lot of fun and i i definitely have one that stands out and yeah uh, Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Like, uh, the funny thing is, I didn't want to see if you thought I was negative or positive <laughs> overall. I would have gotten a little sad <laughs> if I, you would have said, oh, you're going to hate all of these. And then I would have been sad and whatnot. But we can get right into it and into the big book, uh, the one that will feature probably more here. It, it even is a bit oversized. It is the, the dark ride. I almost called it the last ride. Dark ride number one. Written and created by Joshua Williamson with also Andre Bresson as creator and artist, Andreana Lucas on colors and Pepper So on letters. And it seems to be the birthright team. And this is the thing when people talk about Joshua Williamson and they talk about the idea of him doing the Dark Crisis now, Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, and doing the big event book at DC. And some people are down on him. I'll tell you, I was positive at first, and I'm getting a little wary of, of that story, but. He usually doesn't disappoint when he ends up having these creator owned things, these little, you know, side stories. And he is a guy who really likes horror. He likes the idea of of writing horror stuff. It almost feels a little like James Tynan a bit when you have that where, yeah, they do the big stuff. But when they go and do the stuff, say, at Image that this is at, they really get to kind of have passion projects. And I think you can tell right away that this is something that he's really interested in. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you can tell it's, it's horror done. I mean, th- th- I'll say straight up, I, this is my favorite comic. I mean, the, that, yeah. of the three that we're reviewing and uh, he does a really good job and, and it feels good to be able to say something because I've been a little down on Joshua Williamson lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, straight up, I, you know, I was not a fan of his flash run. He brought me back with Robin. He impressed me with Damien and Robin. He made me like Damien again. And then Dark Crisis, I started up. I, I enjoyed Infinite Frontier. I, I really, really love Justice League Incarnate. I'm a little down on Dark Crisis. So, yeah. uh, but you know what? Joshua Williamson, he's uh, taken, I think, he's, he's, he's pay, paid his dues. He's worked his ass off for DC. And, uh, so, and uh, it's so great to see him come up with something like this because it, this is a lot of fun. And, yeah, it is. you know, and his collaboration uh, with Andre Berson, I, I read his birthright, all 50 issues of his birthright were, uh, it was up and down, but it ended on a high note. It actually ended with a happy ending, which was really good. I, I, I would argue that birthright was actually an ending that I liked. Yeah, that's one of our problems that we have with him, <laughs> that he doesn't nail the endings. That's and, right. So Yeah, so that that's cool. And even Nailbiter and stuff like that, people, I think they forget about that. And a lot of people, when he did come over to D.C. and start doing some, like you said, Flash, he had a 100-issue run. That's one of the longest runs of that book. And they didn't seem to either know about his indie stuff or they just didn't care but the indie stuff has always been looked at as really really good and like you said up and down but every book is Uh, you know you have a 50 issue birthright run there's going to be some downers in that but i didn't finish it so i'm glad to hear that it ended on a high note and at least you know stuck the landing there this actually is a book that's it's weird because it's one of those it's fun 
but it's also horrific. But it's done in that way that it's not necessarily like just a horror comic. It seems to be there's going to be some feels to it, but it also is a story of a wacky family. There's a lot of Easter eggs in this as well because the art ends up, and you could tell that Bresson and him, they have that relationship. They end up being able to play off each other and let the art tell the story a lot, even at the beginning when it's in this black and white beginning where we see the beginnings of this park, this crazy, you know, horror amusement park in Vegas, that it starts out with murder and mayhem and, and demonic stuff. I thought it was a pretty cool start. How about you? Yeah, it was really good. I, I love the use of black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <clears throat> just, I mean, right away, you know that something's off. And, and you know, it's funny because I forget, <laughs> I actually saw, I, I there was a preview of dark ride in another comic that we reviewed mm -hmm. last week i can't remember what it was but and i had no idea what the preview was because it never it never had an like at the end of the preview it, it ended up being the first few pages of of dark ride but i didn't know what it was and it was creepy it was about this guy that sort of uh, his having an argument with his wife about a about an idea gone wrong because he has this this guy named arthur dante has this dream about creating a like a Disneyland, but for like a mm -hmm. horror Disneyland and his wife, he gets fired because it's a dumb idea. It's not family friendly enough. And then he ends up killing his wife, driving her out to the desert and then burying her in a hole. And before he can bury her and throw dirt on her and bury her, there's this eerie devilish voice talking to him from the hole that he's thrown his body's wife, his, his body's wife in. Yeah, and yeah. You, you get a sense of course, that that you know he makes a pact with the devil and that leads to the creation of this devil land which is the premise of dark ride and arthur dante is you know grows older and has children with the second wife and and that's we're right away like we're 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 thrown right into it from that and it's such a, a great way to start cuz right away you know that hey oh, this is going to be creepy because right after you have this that black and white sequence the next thing you see is this beautiful amusement park so, mm -hmm. And it's colorful, and so you you make this transition, uh, and I, I think it's Adriana Lucas on the colors, uh, I think. But I mean, just a beautiful transition from black yeah. and white and gloomy to this bright, beautiful amusement park uh, with a dark rising castle in the background, and it's. I like it's, the big guillotine. Yeah. It's this huge guillotine that's like so <laughs> big. I mean, yeah. you see it next to a roller coaster. And what I like too, and if you've watched say werewolf by night you have that same feel you end up that black and white really feels classic universal monsters beginning yeah. uh almost in the idea that in my mind arthur here he has a it, he's the vision of it and he loves horror you can tell like he's a classic horror fan even by just that black and white and then when you go to the current and have the deal and I, it, it doesn't look run down or whatever but when you get the colors and that splash of colors now you know like okay now is modern times at least now and when we go through it i think it plays out on the second read of okay now we have to make things more modern there's going to be a bit of problems with the whole modernization of the world even not just the park and the park does seem like it might be a little bit behind the times in the idea that it's hard to scare this is one of the things that I talk to Eric about all the time about horror movies and things like that, that he really loves. I'm not a big fan, but it's the idea of what can you do anymore to scare people and how you have to up it, but also the family friendly bit, trying to kind of get that whole feel. And I, I thought that it played out really well as a background to what also is pretty horrific of things that are going on. And when you're, you're going through this, you can only imagine, that's why I love comic stories like this, where you're not going to really worry about the idea of the semantics of they're never going to be able to have a 80 foot guillotine that could end <laughs> up, you know, killing somebody or, the, you know, oh, my God, they would never allow blood to run through the streets here in this amusement park. You just go with it and have fun with it. And it's pretty cool. And I do love amusement parks. So it is fun there. You even have a map at that point and you get to see the behind the scenes through our point of view character who may or may not continue. It's a weird ending, but Owen, this kid is a big fan of the park, a big fan of this. This is like his favorite thing. And he gets his dream job of just working 
at the park and he's likable too and that's that's the thing you you have characters in this even when he goes and he ends up meeting this katie kingston who is kind of like a little bit of a supervisor i'm going to take you through this day we're going to figure it out she's like one of those well i just work here to go to college but that makes sense she's not exactly the greatest character i don't love her love her but it's a it's a well done character and you get these little characters in here but i really liked owen and I'm sure that he's going to continue in a weird way, even though of what we see is really horrific in here. Um, but I love that he's a super fan. And he once said, like, one day I want to make a ride. And that seems that it seems like the perfect day or the worst day for him to start. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it does. And and uh, what's what what I the fact that he's a super fan is what really pulls the reader in, because it's through Owen ranting and raving about everything in the park that we learn something about the park as we go yep. along. And, and it's, and, and it's even more, what really makes it more interesting is that you get both sides, you get the super excited fan and then, then you get the bored to death, actual people who work there. Yeah. And, uh, it's just, it's kind of a shithole here. We get, it's long hours. we got to clean puke off this and puke off that. And, and then you, he meets, even meets the security guys and the security guys are bitching that there's, people that are having sex and yeah. some of the animatronics and you know there's people being caught doing obscene things and it's the stuff behind the scenes that you don't really think about when you're going to cal you know when you're going to an amusement park here we have callaway park near our place here in, in okay. alberta and it's you know you don't think about the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and so it's kind of a you got all this you got the super fans so excited about the rides and he oh and dreams of creating his own ride one day and and then of course he gets there and it's like the real world sort of like slamming into his face mm -hmm. and, yeah it's not all roses kid <laughs> yeah that's what i like it is one of those things when you think of you know oh man this would be so great it'd be like me and you oh my god it'd be awesome writing a comic book and then when it comes to it and they're yelling and screaming at us <laughs> we have a deadline they the reality is a little more harsh and so when you, when you get that in, around my area, we actually have like a Hershey Park. We have Dorney Park that's only about 30 minutes away. And we have Great Adventure, Six Flags deal. We have a ton around ours. And as a kid, we would go a lot to amusement parks. And I liked it. And it's funny, too, because you're playing with that idea of usually a park will have that one, you know, haunted house type ride or one of those scary, you know, roller coasters. Even around here, around everywhere, they usually... At this time, they'll reopen the parks, or at least they're still open, but they'll turn it into a Halloween theme deal for the month of October. A lot of them do that. This is just year round. And it, I'm telling you, you even have, like you said, the Disney castle, but it's the, the horror castle. And you have all these things are so cool to even look at. And you do get that enthusiasm from Owen. And as it's kind of being chipped away a bit, he still is pretty fired up. He still is excited. You end up where the best is he meets the, the mascots, Danny D, Evil, Old Nick, and the fun. <laughs> and you know, like, just from the setup, you're like, they're not good. Like, there's yeah. something, everything is a little off where... They're creepy. They're creepy out. looking. Oh, yeah. And then even he says, just to keep going, I like what you said. He's the point of view character. So instead of narration of the park went and did this and they had this ride, you have the super fan who's just gushing about everything to this girl, Katie, who doesn't really care. So it, it ends up being good because she's not really going to respond much to it because she just keeps saying, yeah, I don't really care about that. I'm just here for God. But it works out. So it's not as wordy. If she responded with, yeah, and I like this and I it might get too much, but it's just him excited for that first day and it makes sense and when he sees these mascots he's like i dressed up as danny d evil uh, in elementary school and i got a saturday <laughs> detention they're like whatever come on and th their job he he's pretty much a janitor he's pretty much he's got to clean up which i like even that the idea because you can keep going just grab the broom buddy and go it's not going to be that much of a explanation yeah. of your job right now they just have to keep things clean in a park that looks like it's impossible. I mean, you see just so much crap laying around that I don't even know what the trash is and what the attractions are, but it's fun. <laughs> and like I said, there are Easter eggs. If you look and you like Sven Gulli, the horror host, at one point he's just walking behind them and it made me <clears throat> giggle. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more than just that. I'm sure that this is just full of them. I'm just not, like I said, a big horror fan that I would know. But the things that I did recognize made me laugh. And we do find out, you know, a personal story 
uh, about our main character, Owen, that is kind of like it's a mystery, but it's still it's sad and it it does set up something later. Yeah, it's very well, it, it's disturbing. And I, I think one of the uh, one of the things that plays out so well f- from Owen's enthusiasm is that. You know, often the people that are the happiest and maybe the most enthusiastic are holding, you know, they're, they're comp, you know, they're trying to cover something up and Mm -hmm. clearly something very horrific happened in Owen's past. And it appears if his, his, him and his sister lost their parents, they were lost at sea. And, uh, at one point, all four of them were on the, on their raft. And then I think their parents drowned, Owen and his sisters, parents drowned. And so obviously something went on there. You got to wonder if it's horrific because He's, he says that his sister hates horror, but he loves horror. So it's kind of interesting there. And Owen's enthusiasm also is is the very mechanism by which I unfortunately dooms him by the end of the issue because it attracts the attention of Arthur Dante. Because you can imagine that uh, young Owen here, his enthusiasm is probably just as it it it's mm-hmm. reminiscent of the enthusiasm that Arthur Dante, the creator of Devil's Land actually had early on in his career that led to its creation because young Owen, of course, has dreams of creating his own ride. And it would appear that the power of this park comes from the rides and, and it yeah. needs, you know, it's, it's losing money. And, and as we'll learn as we go on. So it, it, it really works. What I lo- love about this opening issue, what Williamson does so well is he's tying in these character moments with, with, with the dialogue, with the plot mm-hmm. and with the story moving forward. And so I'm I'm impressed. I honestly, uh, this is uh, actually I, I find this a little bit better than even the the best of Birthright. If I'm being honest. I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's big. And yeah, you have this kid and his sister. Their parents, unfortunately, looks like they died. Uh, and yeah, he runs right into which is funny. It's Arthur Dante, the creator of the park. His son is running the park now. Sam Haynes, Sam. They go by. He's walking around, and he just ends up where Owen bumps into him. And like, hey, kid, like, what's up? And he seems like, you know, older, but not too much older. He's a young guy. But you also get that little, you know, back and forth because we find out that him and his sister, Halloween, uh, they end up kind of having like this weird deal. Now, everybody hasn't seen nobody's seen Arthur in a while. You even have this weird deal where there is a video YouTuber who comes in. Hey, everybody, here's Mysteries of the Park, and I'm here at Devil Land, and we're going to find this and that. But in the meantime, you do kind of get that play of a brother and sister that might mirror a bit of who, Owen's deal. Who, who, does, who does that YouTuber look like to you? I, I didn't know. It's, it's it, James Tynion. That's James oh, Tynion. It, it, yeah, actually, it does look <laughs> it like, looks like James Tynion. I'm looking. It looks just like him. Um, uh, he might be making fun of him. I don't know. It is funny, though. He's like, hey, everybody, it's me. He puts on those glasses. Yeah, let's and go have a Frankenstein look, pizza. It does look like it. Yeah, it does look like Tynion. Yeah, let's go get pizza. Uh, and yeah, in that, though, you end up having Sam, who's running the park right now, for his daddy's walking around there with their, you know, the head honchos, which everybody seems very laid back. This doesn't look as, you know, boardroom fancy as as what usually you'll have. And they're walking around the park because Sam says, I'm going to, you know, go around and mingle and see what's going on because the park is losing money. And he runs into Owen or Owen runs right in him, smack into him. And they're introducing people. Hey, this is our PR guy. This is this guy, this guy. And the big play here is, is that they're trying to convince again, like you said at the beginning, the idea of we need a family friendly play here. Maybe that's why we're not making money, because we need it to be family friendly, not as scary, maybe a little separate kids part. And Owen thinks that's a bad idea. That goes against the spirit spirit of the park. And he says that, and I do like it. It really starts to remind me, I thought we were going to get a little secret of my success type deal of, you know, there's the kid who, and we still might. I mean, there's the kid who gets hired one day as pretty much a janitor, goes around and sweeps up. And now he's making boardroom decisions just because he runs into the owner. He likes his moxie, things like that. But in that, while that's going on, you are introduced then to Sam's sister. And it... (laughs) I just like the idea that it looks like she's in, you know, some D list horror movies. She also has a sex tape and it gets pretty graphic. Like everybody's like, we, I love you for this. And I love you for that. I've watched your sex tape. And she's there causing a commotion, which really pisses off 
Sam because this is his park. This is his thing. And now she has to come in and steal all the thunder here, at least as they're walking through. And I think it also is one of those, like, what the hell are you here? You know, you're not even supposed to be here. Oh, dad sent for me. Oh, crap. Like, well, what's going to go on with there? But I do like where you have this bit where Sam ends up pretty much firing all of the head honchos that he has hired, even friends of his. The one guy is like a lifelong friend. And he's like, you're all out. You guys are out. You're you're leading me the wrong way because he got information from Owen, the, the janitor kid who just got. And then. Once his sister's there and he gets pissed, he just shoves by Owen. I felt bad for <laughs> Owen. Then he's like, "Get out of the way, trash boy!" And just goes through because once he sees his sister, he gets a little dark and he he wants to go see his dad. That's where we get James Tynan and also the other head of the kind of janitors there, who is like the old guy at the park. That's like a kind of a a grittier version, but really is from any Scooby Doo. Even the idea of that old guy who's always you know, ah, get out of yeah. here. And <laughs> And it was pretty fun and the art's really good. But then, then we go and see, you know, at the end, and this is where it gets, it gets scary. I mean, up until now, it's, it's just a cool deal. The amusement park. Yeah. It's horror based, but also I see Rob zombie behind James Tynan at one point, by the way. Uh, But then you go and it's nighttime and Owen realizes he lost his ID badge. And that was said to him before by the security guy. If you lose that, you're going to have to deal with me, whatnot. So he doesn't want to get yelled at. But you go from there because he goes off to the park. And I do like the change. And the coloring really does play a really good deal from the black and white to the color. Then in this to the nighttime where it does start to get a little more eerie, right? Yeah, the the coloring is fantastic. The transitioning uh, of the color. Right away, you get a different set. You You get multiple moods. For this, mm-hmm. and it is a horror comic, but you go from uh, it starts off with a murder in black and white, so it feels like classic horror, and then it moves into like the fr- beautiful sunny day in Devil Land. Come have some fun, get the shit, you know, get the shit scared out of you, you know, have some fun, and then it gets darker and gloomier, and uh, and it's exemplified again by Owen's enthusiasm, and, and yeah. Owen's enthusiasm pulls the reader in because we're enthused because we're kind of funny because he's going by all these rides with these uh, double alphabet names, you know, Devil's Do, which is the, <laughs> Devil's Do was the first ride that was created by Arthur Dante, and uh, it's Devil's Do is ultimately is where Owen ultimately gets led into. Uh, near the end where he doesn't seem to come out and there's other rides murder mountain zombie zoom werewolf woods vampire village cannibal cafe clown carnage oh yeah i mean they're all they're all a play on the not necessarily original names but uh, i mean it's you you can tell they're having fun with it Mm -hmm. owen at the end here uh it clearly uh well we, we should back up a bit because uh, J- the james tinian character is like a youtuber and the youtuber yeah. that's another way that uh, uh writer williamson is uh, joshua williamson is getting information to the reader not only through owen's enthusiasm talking about the park but also through the, this youtuber who's doing a video talking about where's arthur dante because apparently arthur dante has been missing so even though arthur dante has called his his children sam and halloween dante because he wants to meet with them he's actually mm-hmm. been missing from the public eye for many apparently many uh, for many months or maybe years. And so, uh, but meanwhile, before the children, before Halloween and uh, Sam meet with their father, uh, this Owen gets lured into the Devil's Due, which is the first ride that the park ever had. And uh, he sees a horrific image of his parents, like yeah. puppets floating in, almost like they're floating in the ocean and and quite a horrific scene. And, you know, how would they know that? How would, you know, how would yeah. they know th- this child's trauma and terror? And and then, of course, you got those creepy uh, mascots, D- Danny D, F- evil old Nick and the fun sort of staring at him. And then they they force him into this ride and. And and force him into the the devil's do where we hear him we hear him scream but and, and then it just sort of veers off the, that the yeah. screaming ends and then it and then the next thing we see is the dark castle where Sam and Halloween are meeting with their father Arthur Dante and uh, it's just a really really great transition and yeah. it 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 ultimately and the conversation then but between the the children you know and and their father. 
because the, 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 uh, these siblings hate each other. I love oh, the sibling yeah. rivalry. Yeah. She, he calls her a train wreck. And she calls him a sellout. I mean, <laughs> they don't yeah. like each other. She doesn't even want to run the park. The only reason why she's there is because her father basically demanded it. And you get the sense that maybe he's got all the money or some power. And so these are kids. These are spoiled brat, unlikable mm-hmm. kids, jerks. And, uh, you know, very clearly this Arthur Dante seems to be happy because he he seems to have, he has he's got the shit eating evil looking grin on his face because you know he's just found a way he's got a new ride and it's almost as if he gets his power from it, it from the from killing young Owen it shows a scene of Owen dying horribly and I yeah. gotta tell you man that's just what got me is because you really get to like this Owen kid <laughs> and and yeah. then, and and then on the final page, when you see what happens to Owen, it's like, hey, yeah, yeah, this is not a, you know, this isn't a family friendly comic. This, this isn't mm-hmm. like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that we're going to be no, doing. No, we'll be doing. I, I agree. <laughs> I, I just wonder if it's going to be one of those next issue begins and Owen, this all like he wakes up and he's like, man, what happened? Oh, there must have been a dream. Like something with that, because it does say, you know, that Arthur is inspired now. And you ended up having Owen wanting to make this right. I wonder what the play is. What I actually really like in this, again, where we said the YouTuber, the James Tynan, he ends up setting up. But some of the other info that you get here, which I think is cool, we've never been in the Devil's Do ride. You know, me and you, nobody has. This is in the comic here. Mm-hmm. So when Owen goes in and we know it's set up, super fan. He says he's been in all these rides tons of times and the idea that his mom and dad, like his dad used to take him there all the time. And and it was a family thing that kind of gives you the idea of why the sister might not want that. It might bring up bad memories. It might be whatever. But when he goes in the devil's do, which we don't know, and he's like, wait a second, this isn't right. Like right away, then, you know, because he's a super fan if, if, without that. We wouldn't know that this is any different than it because this is the first time we're seeing it. So I like when he's like, man, this isn't like it was here before. I've never seen this. So you realize right away, like, oh, no, there's trouble. The big play, when you see those mannequins in the water and it's his parents drowning, you just are like, oh, my God, what the hell is going on? The weird play is, is he just says mom. And reaches out. It's not like mom, dad. He just says mom. <laughs> and then he's kind of interrupted a bit. But yeah, he's like, I'm out of here. And then you see, you know, the, the trio there. But even then, before you see like a zombie guy in the background as well, that is in the dark. And I'm like, I don't know. That might be Arthur. But it's a weird play. Uh, but yeah. all this stuff is pretty cool. And when he goes in, I don't know if anybody even remembers the tubes, the band, the tubes. There was a video for uh, She's a Beauty that they end up. It's almost the exact thing. They strap this kid into like this, this roller coaster like type ride and send him through the store that slammed shut. Made me giggle. Nobody will remember it. But in that, even the Dark Castle deal, James Tyne and he was right on. He said, some people are saying that he's holed up in the dark castle. <laughs> yeah, he is. You're right. And you you just imagine this YouTuber James Tynan character is going to get in too deep and he's going to end up. He'll find some weird stuff or whatever if he keeps going through this. I hope he does. Just the idea. He starts poking around, tries to interview people. And I think that we'll find even some of the people who are like longtime employees and things like that. They might be a little sus, all these things going on, Uh, but it's pretty cool setup. And then at the end, yeah, you end up having old uh, Arthur telling Sam, I have some inspiration. I'm inspired again. And then you do see our guy Oliver getting ripped apart. But then you see that it's also like drawings on the drawing board of setting up a ride. And you're like, Oh my God. It also has like a Hellraiser part on the one side and just, Oh, it's, it's horrific. And it gets real. Like at the end, you're like, all right, I get it. This is a hard, comic. <laughs> like it's horrific the way that these demons come to life of what are the mascots and then just start eating them and ripping them apart as he burns. Oh, it's crazy. Uh, but I liked it. I liked it a lot. I actually yeah. am impressed by it. And I'm, uh, this will definitely continue with, as it goes on, hopefully it, it continues being as good as as this first issue, because I thought this was great. 
Yeah, it, it is. And uh, you you alluded, you mentioned it before, but there is actually, it's a really good idea. It's it's well done. There's a there's actually a pamphlet, like a, like a handout pamphlet yeah. in Devil Land that actually has all the rides as if you were actually there and all the rides are numbered. Typical of what you get when you go to a, an amusement park. It shows you a map and logistically where you can go, where all the rides are. It's very well done. It's ve- it's very apparent that Joshua Williamson and Breslin and, and uh, Lucas, like, the entire creative team here clearly did a lot of hard work for this opening issue to pull people in. And it yep. really, really works. Uh, and it definitely is going to be reflected in my score. Would you give it? Uh, I'm going to give it a, I, I probably will go a nine, three. Was, I could even go nine, five. I, I thought it was really good. Yeah. I'm just looking at the tunnel of love craft. <laughs> I'm looking at the, the pamphlet and the pamphlet even has the creases like you've been using it. What would yeah. you give it? Uh, I would go uh, yeah, nine, five, two. I, yeah, I just, th- this has all the hallmarks of, I don't know how anybody could read this and not want to read the second issue. Cause I mean, it's, it ends on, there's so much I want to know. What's the fate of Owen? Is he really dead? Uh, is this, uh, you know, is it, what what's what's Arthur Dante? What what devil did what deal did he make with the devil? Uh, what about the children? Uh, is like it's so many eerie things that are going on here. What's the price that he's going to pay? He doesn't really seem to care about money or anything else. Mm-mm. It's really about maybe capturing souls, or it's not about economics of it. It's about the horror, and I it's 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 eerie. It's eerie, and it's but I love how Williamson is sort of you know incorporating just the real world into this the you mm-hmm. the, his point of view characters it's going to be interesting to see now that our point of view character owen assuming he's dead you know moving forward how is he the point of view character is now gone and and i think owen was utilized so well in that opening issue without him it's going to be interesting to see if uh you know how it is moving fo- uh it's how it is moving forward because there there are some you know there's some little things uh william's yeah. approach to some things aren't you know aren't always my cup of tea. This, this, I would not have guessed that Williamson wrote this, to be honest with you, if I, if you wouldn't have told me, <laughs> uh, straight up. But I, you're I, complimenting him. Yeah, I, I want to make sure compliment. you know, people realize that. And uh, just for a deal, I did look for, I did look at the Dark Ride 2 solicit just to see if it says anything on here or whatnot, but it does not say anything about, you know, uh, Oliver, so we'll have to see, or Owen, I mean, I'm sorry, it, it looks more like a deal where they're going to go into Sam and Halloween more in this next one, so we'll have to see, and uh, with that, though, I, I do, even you said the sibling sibling rivalry, I thought was really cool, and it's funny because right now, I am actually, I finished watching Legacy, a documentary series on the Los Angeles Lakers, and the owner, Jerry Buss, and then how his kids kind of ended up getting caught. And he has a bunch of kids and they kind of got embroiled in this. Who's going to take over the team? Who's involved? And it plays out a lot like this because there are some of the kids who are like, no, I don't really care about the team, but I like the money and I, I don't do this or I ended up getting dissed. And so I like that idea of the two kids. Also, I, I'm hoping again, I'm saying that I think that maybe Oliver ends up, I keep saying Oliver, Owen keeps going because we got told about a sister and like there's some things that you want to know how his family all that and well, so I, we'll I think, see but, yeah you know. i think well i think what's interesting i think his sister might be the, yeah. the, the protagonist moving Maybe. forward she might be look she might investigate the death of her brother or he goes missing and she ends up probably suspecting something's off with the park and and then we're going to find out the truth i suspect well, it's funny when when it when it flashback to the death of Owen's parents. Yeah. I, I thought they I thought maybe there was cannibalism involved. I thought maybe they ate their Yeah, parents. it's weird. <laughs> you know? I, I got the I got the sad thing of like they just died and they had to dump them over, but maybe they maybe they took a swim for it. Maybe there's something even worse. I don't know. We don't even know how they end up because they're on like a life raft kind of thing, but we don't know how or what or so it's pretty crazy. Uh but we'll have to see. We'll have to see how it goes and we'll see if old uh Owen Seasons, I guess is his full name. It says here that uh, see what happens with him and see what happens with the ride and all that. But, yeah, it's a shame if we don't get any more of him because I really did like him. I liked him <laughs> a lot. Uh, but 9-5 from both of us, it's pretty, pretty darn good. But we'll yeah. move on to the next one. This next one is the one where I kept seeing reviews saying, oh, my, this is a great start of a horror series. This is so, you know, scary and spooky. And then I read it and I thought – 
I don't know. This could be played out as just a kid's kind of little bit scary cartoon even. I know it gets a little bit, you know, into the idea of people dying and things like that, but not even done in a real horrific way. It's more of the the mood and stuff that Mike Mignola does even in Hellboy. But this, I thought, was more, you know, laid back and subtle than a lot of those. But I saw people, but it's Leonide the Vampire, the Vampire. Miracle at the Crow's Head, script by Mike Mignola, art by Rachel Aragno, colors by Dave Stewart, letters by Clem Robbins. And I do like the art. I thought that the art fits like a cartoony gothic feel of the story. It's very it's like we just went through uh, an issue that really impressed me with surprising me and and go, oh, my God, this is cool. And the coolness of the, the park and the horror and what? This actually, and I end up doing a Hellboy podcast, a reading club on our Patreon. And when this didn't surprise me. I mean, and Mike Mignola doing this, it didn't surprise me. It has this feel. It's not as fancy as it once, you know, Hellboy had been at points. But it's a nice little start to a story, but it feels a little more incomplete than, say, what we just went through with Dark Ride. It's one of those that I think by the end, if you're into it because of the feel or the mood, I think that will push you forward more than just the story because the story seems to be, you know, still set in mystery, still setting up where you get this, what looks like a little, little vampire girl. I, it, I'm i telling you, I, I'm going to give it to you because I want to know what you thought it being somebody. I don't know if you've read a lot of Hellboy or Mike Mignola stuff. No. Well, well, actually, I, I haven't. Ironically enough, I've started to read purely by accident a lot of a lot more Dark Horse because I'm reading okay, more yeah. lately. And I just happen to every a lot of the one shots, a lot of the stories yeah. I've been reading happen to have been related to the Hellboy universe. So I actually, mm-hmm. I'm learning about these characters for the first time and Leonide is is one of them here. And this is a very straight, short, forward story. Uh, and I, I like it. It's, it's, I like like it. A, it's a short story, in a, uh, one shot, and it, we, we get a little bit of mythology. It, it actually reminds me a little bit of Creepshow, actually. You okay. know, which we reviewed it, but a Creepshow, but instead it, uh, creep show has one edge on this, and that is I creep show. I like I like creep show. I like the the old raggedy character that sort of mm. talks in the talks to the yeah, reader. Yeah. That's the only thing that this is missing. This could easily be a creep show comic, but this idea that we're we're just in this old village near 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 somewhere in the world, uh, and you know it's an old town. It's dying out. It's the cl- uh, everyone's getting older. It's slowly dying, and and. A couple of men might make a wish. One guy wishes he was younger because he misspent his youth, and another person wished that they would have traveled more. And apparently, this is a wish. Uh, you know, following that, there's this ship that crash lands on their shore, crashes against the rocks, and they find this coffin. And within this coffin is this pristine, beautiful looking girl uh, who's, I'm not even sure if she's ever given a name. Is she given a name? I, on the coffin, it says Leonide. But so is, is you're going to go with the idea of the, you know, the title character but, being the name of the deal. But that's all it is on there. It says on the coffin. That's it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I thought it says, is, uh, it, I don't know if it says Leonide. I guess it does. It says yeah. Leonide on the on coffin. The coffin. It's okay, very odd. I thought Leonide was the vampire, mm-hmm. the head father vampire who shows up at the end and sort of takes her away. But um, in any event. The, the whole point here is that this this Leonide, this girl shows up in this coffin and everyone feels young again. The entire town feels vibrant, feels more alive. They, they're, they're happy and they just, you know, everyone seems to be in, in better spirits and they attribute it to her. And so much so that when they, they're sort of like the Van Helsing character, yeah. <laughs> this other character, this priest, I guess, sort of. Resurrects or comes back. Dead. Yeah, comes, I guess he comes dead, back and yeah. warns the village, and 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 they, of course, they reject him, saying, "Oh, get away from us! Where there's nothing wrong with this." You know, okay, granted, we did find her in a coffin. That should have been a clue. But yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but you know, yeah. we like this woman. Leave us alone. We, we we're going to enjoy it for what it is. And uh, it's funny, and that, and uh, well, I can let you talk a little bit more about it now. But 
I, I actually really love the ending here because it wasn't actually a terrible ending. That the fate no, of this town no. is not horrible. It's just really weird. And it's funny because this feels like I guess it kind of fits in, you know, say the American Thanksgiving coming up in November. But even so, the idea of a Puritan type village, maybe this is in, you know, up in the North Deal. You have it in Vermont, say, or whatever. It does feel like that. And again, because we talked about the colors in the first issue in Dark Ride, I'll bring up the colors here because you really play the idea that Dave Stewart goes. And this is a dreary Puritan town doesn't look like anybody likes to have fun. They end up, you know, all this stuff and they're all dressed in blacks and whites. And then you end up having this Leonide, if it is her, you know, that's her name. The coffin goes and all of a sudden that's like the brightest thing that you see, even when they go and look at the, the gold, you know, writing on it. And when they open it up and see her, it is something that ends up bringing light to this crazy town that we don't know much about. And even the one guy, Oh, she's so beautiful cries and her tears, tears drop on her. And she kind of opens up her eyes. And the the thing is, they, they're very accepting in things. I mean, there's this girl who was in a shipwreck in a coffin and they open up and it's like, Oh my God, it's a miracle. And they all start celebrating and all of a sudden more and more color in their clothing, in their, you know, you see, oh, that person's a redhead and that's this. And that guy is a green coat. And they're all like, yeah, let's drink. She keeps saying like, oh, yeah, yeah, just drink. But they're very accepting, especially when the the resurrected priest comes back and comes in. He's obviously a dead. Pri- they know that he's dead. They know him. <laughs> and he comes in. I mean, they're bringing the bell out there that probably hasn't been rung in a while. Everybody's excited. And that ends up where the priest gets resurrected at that point. You're having straight up party time there where everybody's going to drink and you don't even realize or know at this point. Like, I thought it was going to be one of those. And like a creep show, I'm waiting for that monkey paw, not thinking what ended up happening, which I did like. I thought they were going to do one of those where they just dance and drink themselves to oblivion here and all die. They forget about everything else they're supposed to do. They forget the priest comes in and pretty much speaking Latin and whatnot, saying, you know, Come on now, you, you're you going away from God. Even go through the whole deal. You know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they're all pissed at you. You got to stop. This isn't right. And that's where you end up seeing this little girl. You kind of see the true deal of her. Like, all of a sudden, she gets really, like, you know, mean towards this guy. And they all take him out. Take him, burn him, and all that. But <laughs> in that, she goes off, and she starts pretty much – killing everybody but collecting their souls they look like butterflies little deal there and that's kind of a japanese thing which i i thought was pretty cool but gathering up these souls in this little coffin that she has but turning them into bird like the idea of i want to see the world hey okay well now you're a crow you can go and fly around like it's it's that monkey paw but is it because these the just say the lady who said i want to see the world she was going to die soon anyway. Now she's a crow. She can go off. And it, it's it's a weird play at the deal, even with the idea that the, this dead priest who just is horrific but fits well in the Mignola universe there, he's just still around. He's like, I'm going to go and find you. You're not going to get away from me. I'm like, what is this guy doing? Look at this guy. What, what I find funny is that when, when this priest shows up, the one guy says, he's a madman. And I'm thinking to myself, the guy's a skeleton. Yeah, he's a he's talking a skeleton. skeleton. I mean, yeah. I, why he's would a zombie. Him? Get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're like, just like, oh, listen to him, burn him. He, yeah. He's a bad man. I'm like, no, no. And I think, and I actually thought, because they're dragging him away yeah. through the town, I'm like, they're going to rip off his arms. And I'm like, what is it? There's nothing left of this guy. No, no. Uh, but I did think it was, I thought it was well done. I mean, and especially oh. once it seems that. The girl, okay, the the jig is up. I got to get this thing going and then does start getting these souls. As you see, these people wither away as the souls come out of their, you know, or even just their life essence, whatever you'd call it, come out of their mouth and she collects those. Um, But then you end up even seeing more where all of a sudden then you see where that shipwreck goes down and out comes a big giant bat that seems to be, you know, her father. She says, I'm ready, father. And he's just this huge vampire bat that's led us away. And you have them go away. And that's where you end up having this priest say Leonide. And then you end up, hey, I know, priest. Yeah, now forget about me. I'm going to go. I did my deal. You're never going to remember. And he's like, nope, 
I remember you. If only I could forget, but I will find you and I will take you down. It's such a crazy ending to this. And like I said, other than the idea that it seems like most people in this village, you know, a lot of them are dead, whatnot. It's not exactly not, you know, it's kind of all ages, but it isn't. Yeah. But it's, it has that feel, and the art looks that. I thought it, it was kind of cute. It reminds me of an episode of Rick and Marty, where yeah, where yeah. Mar- where uh, uh, where Rick uh, created, or part of me, Rick was battling against the devil because the mm-hmm. devil was granting wishes to yeah, everybody. Yeah. But the, of course, uh, you'd always there'd always be some negative consequence of the wish, mm-hmm. and so and this that's what this reminds me of. And so it's interesting that this this devil is or this vampire through his daughter is technically granting some wishes here but there's a darker twist to it so oh you want to live you want to be young again okay but only for 24 hours you never said for how long or you want to see the world okay but you never said you wanted to see the world as a human i'm going to make you a bird or a bat yeah 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 yeah. you know there's always a twist you got to be very specific when you make a wish you know yeah And, and again what i like about it Normally in these things, you have to know that you're making a wish towards, say, <laughs> yeah. a demon or, you know, exactly. this is just people just sitting around like, man, <laughs> I wish that this would happen. I wish that we could be this. And, you know, they're just wishes of old people who don't want to die. And, you know, they're even debating. The one guy's like, oh, man, I wish I could just die now. Well, he got his wish. Yeah. And then the other's <laughs> like, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to do this. And, yeah, you end up where, oh, God, there's there's going to be trouble Again, though, I don't know. They had a party. The town lightened up a bit. (laughs) Like at one point, the play is that idea of that Puritan deal. Oh, my God, you sinners. How could you let this happen? They're all just drinking and having a good time at that point. So it's almost like a, hey, priest, you know, get out of town. Like this is what you didn't want us to do before. You're dead. We're having fun. But the fun then leads to, you know, the troubles and they all, you know, a lot of them die. Their yeah. souls are taken. And she even gathers just some of the souls up, it seems. I, I do think it's interesting. The title uh, or the subtitle, Miracle at the Crow's Head, yeah. uh, is kind of funny because at some point they, they call Leonide or Leonide, they call her, they refer to her as the miracle. And so, yeah. and yet it's it's really not much of a, you know, no. I don't really think it's much of a miracle at the crow's head, particularly since it appears to have, you know, no one's living in the town anymore. So, but it's just, it's an eerie sort of, horror sort of like eerie way of sort of thinking about a miracle and it you know it was it was very it was unexpected but it was yeah it was an easy read. yeah it, a very easy read right yeah, very easy yeah. remind me a little Coraline like if you ever saw that or read yeah. the book the Neil Gaiman deal it uh, it had that feel to it yeah. very easy read and at the end like I said I I going through it now, once again, I actually even liked it a little more like, OK, we get this. And even looking, it looks like we're going to have a bunch of, you know, one shot stories like this, where it may just be like you said, almost like a, a creep show type deal where Leonid then goes to the next village and sees or maybe through time. Or I don't know how it's going to be set up, but it seems like it's supposed to continue. But this one's just a one and done little fun Hey, be careful what you wish for. Little, you know, cute deal, and maybe partying it up is not the great. Like I, I had fun with it, and again, it's not going to blow your mind. But I thought that it was a nice deal, and it does say one shot, so I guess there's just going to be a series of them. I don't know the the way it spells it out at the beginning. Uh, thing is a little bit mysterious of how this will continue. But what would you give it? Uh, I would give it. You know, I enjoyed it for what it is and being totally unfamiliar with the Hellboy universe. I thought it was very accessible. I'm actually, I'm actually be, I would be curious to know this Leonide if to what, if he was in other Hellboy stories, I'm assuming yeah. he was. And so I'm actually kind of curious, particularly since this vampire seems to have a sense of humor at the very least when he's granting these wishes uh, in sort of like a dark and twisted way. So I'd give a solid 7.5. Yeah, I think I'm an eight. I, I like Mike Mignola, and I don't know the characters here. They might be brand new. I don't know. The way that he plays these, I mean, it's a weird thing. Hellboy itself doesn't really have a series. They just have a bunch of minis, some one-shots. Like you said, at points you don't even realize until after you've already gotten into it. Like, oh, crap, this is part of the Hellboy stuff. And this is, you know, a continuation of th- something like that. So it's kind of a cool deal as it broadens and expands things. But like we said about Junkyard Joe last week 
it's a book that you don't really need to know anything about the universe itself. It's just, you know, may get you a little stepping point into it and maybe expand. Oh, I'll check out some other things if they're like that. But you can read this without ever reading anything. Hellboy and and enjoy it, I think. Again, it's the right time of year for it being October. And other than that, it's cute. It's nice. You get through it. But I did really like the art and the coloring. So that puts me up to an eight. But we'll finish off with a book that this is another one. It's very quick. And if you, you know, kind of like, oh, I like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I don't really know much about them besides the cartoon, then you're in. I mean, 100 percent. You don't need to know anything about, say, the Mirage stuff that started it all that I'm doing right now on another Patreon show. It's more for people who just want to get a feel of the cartoon from back in the day. And there's a lot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle books that come out, but they're really into the, you know, they're far into series and things like that. So I thought that this was pretty good. And I don't know if you actually read the G.I. Joe version of this book a little bit ago that had that same deal. It was playing off the Saturday morning adventures kind of one shots with this whole deal of the cartoon being the basis of it in the G.I. Joe things. And people really like that a lot. And I think people will like this as well. Again, it's not going to blow your mind. But it's going to give you that feel of the Saturday morning cartoons or even coming home from school and watching it, you know, during the weekday after school deal. But it is uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles VR in deep trouble. VR in deep trouble. Oh, my. And, and it's Just caught that, did you? <laughs> yes, I did. I didn't even read the title before. This. I'm like, all right. Uh, story by Eric Burnham. Art by Tim Laddie. Colors by Sarah Meyer. Letters by Sean Lee. I think right away you'll you'll see... Yeah, it gets the feel of the cartoon and the art, especially it's it's funny because when I go into comics, especially stuff that we end up doing and we've talked about this before on all sorts of different things. The idea once you're reviewing stuff, sometimes you lose the thrill of new comics. It, it is a sad part of podcasting or reviewing. You end up seeing it at points of, oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. So when I first open a book, I do end up kind of getting a general feeling and I open it up. I'm like. Who this looks wordy. Like what's going but it, it really doesn't play out that like that. I think that it plays out very quick paced, even with a lot of word bubbles. You have a lot of turtles, so they're doing their thing. But it's basically the turtles getting sucked into a VR video game. And in that, it's just fun. I mean, just that setup makes complete sense. For the turtles, you know, Donatello ends up making this VR deal so they can train, you know, their moves in this. But you get a lot of video game references. You get a lot of stuff. And like I said, the feel of the cartoon. Uh, what did you think? <laughs> this was a very straightforward story, but an yeah. excellent opening one for a first issue because because it, it deals with VR. They're trapped in a video game. Uh, it's very sort of tropey, but it's it's what you it's what you'd want. This would make an excellent uh actual episode. video episode yeah i and, think so too yeah and it, it you know it's it's basically uh, it's 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 a little bit forced but i mean i, I almost feel guilty tr actually trying to criticize this but, but <laughs> because it's it's just meant to be fun you know but yeah that's all but it is i will say that april o'neill who's a reporter she's not actually a news report uh she does. She's not a weather reporter, but they make her give. They make. They turn. They make her to be the, the the weather lady here, saying the weather because they need to establish right on the first page that it, there's a storm because mm. it's the storm that creates the lightning that that causes the VR, the computer, to to screw up. So they get trapped in the virtual reality uh, where they end up being forced to fight uh, all these virtual, all their virtual reality enemies, of course, and, and all, and this is where my ignorance of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comes in, because I should say that I'm not, I've never really been a fan of anthropomorphic yeah, yeah. characters. Um, uh, although the irony is that I actually have a, I actually have a, a, a sizable Teenage Mutant Ninja collection because when I was, but for, for years I bought them presumably for the, ch uh, for, for kids that I would one day have. So, yeah. Uh, but I never actually read them. <laughs> so, yeah. So you just have them. Yeah, like, oh, well. yeah. And here's the thing. Like I said, I'm doing uh, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles podcast on our Patreon, but it's, it's more because I wasn't into them. And so we're yeah. starting, me and Brandon, my man Brandon, are doing that. And we're starting at the Mirage stuff, which is a little darker. It's all in black and white. It's the original stuff. So the cartoon, though, is when you really get what most people know about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But because of that podcast, you know, I, I recognize 
a bunch of the things, you know, obviously Shredder you end up having, but you have Rocksteady and Bebop, but you get other villains in this that I'm not that familiar with. But what you end up getting me is I am familiar with, say, a Super Mario Brothers or a Mario Kart or, you know, a a Street Fighter. And that's what you play in the VR as well. You play up these video games and they are classics as they did this. Now, what I say about it being forced, though, I do I do like the line where you have April doing the news report, bad weather. She looks like she does not want to do it because she isn't the weather person. You end up the turtles. Wait a minute. April's reporting weather. What happened? I guess the other reporter went and stormed out. And then they all like, oh, my God. But that's the kind of, you know, roll your eyes humor that you have. Where I thought it was, though, it's Donatello who makes the says. Yeah, I, I have some fail safes so that no storm can end up affecting this. <laughs> and then right away it does. I'm like, oh, why'd you even say that? You should have just had them kind of get sucked into it anyway. Yeah. But even then you get like the play of any kid uh, as you're growing up at one point has thought of like a Tron type deal of, man, it'd be cool if I got sucked into, you know, a video game or if it was real or I did this. That's the classic of any story that you have even before video games and stuff like that. (laughs) So it is fun. And it just lets the turtles go off and fight different things. They get separated at a point. And in the meantime, the biggest to do, the biggest problem in this is that, Casey Jones and April are supposed to show up and bring pizza and they're not going to be there for it. That's like (laughs) their biggest thing that they're worried about. All I can think of is the hell is Splinter doing this whole time? He's outside of the video. Like, why isn't he trying anything? I guess he just couldn't (laughs) figure it out. I mean, you even have it where you have plays of even wink winks at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games themselves where they go in like, I heard this is pretty hard. It's a pretty hard game. But you even have a start where they get the VR helmets and go in and it does look just like that. But it's fun. Like you said, it's hard to, you know, pish posh it a lot because of that. It's just here for fun. It's this one shot done story like a cartoon like you would have. But I'm sure as it goes on, you'll have some things carry over, which we did. But it's played off as just an episode of the cartoon that would play out great. I mean, it would really play out good yeah. in doing this. And you have Donkey Kong references with Rocksteady and Bebop. You end up getting Shredder. Stuff. It's it's fun. There's yeah. not a ton to talk about here. Well, uh, so I don't want to keep, you know, pounding it in. But yeah. it's fun. That's it, all I can it say. It is. It's a lot of fun. And honestly, even though, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles may not, you know, be my cup of tea. I, I got to say, I got to give a shout out to the art, artist, uh, Tim Latio. Amazing yeah. art. You know, we're we're reviewing with Dark Crisis. And I actually, it reminded me, now you might think, wow, how the hell did this remind <laughs> me of Dark Crisis? Well, all the, all the villains and the heroes on the page. Like yeah, yeah, how they're Tim there. Latino, there, there's a fantastic page where, where Shredder I'm looking at it right and, now. Uh, Rocksteady and Bebop are there and Krang's and I, there. I, you got yeah, them all. I, I yeah. just don't know the names of all the other villains. Exactly. But, but yeah. I mean, I can see them. I'm sure they're all there. In fact, in fact, I think it's Donatello or one of the turtles mentions actually jokes that everyone's here except so, so-and-so. And then all of a sudden she appears. So yep, yeah. I think, I think for Tim Latino. I mean, I'm venturing a guess. I might be wrong, but I'm venturing a guess that every single villain that has ever existed in it might very well be in this comic. I don't know. I'm not a not an expert, but I, I would if you're a if you're a teenage mutant ninja f- needle tur- turtle fan, and even if you're not a fan of the animated version of that, put up yeah. by IDW, I think I think this would be a very good just. I mean, artistically, this is fantastic. It, it really is. And it has all the villains. I mean, this is everything all in one. And this is a lot of work to do this. I mean, if this was a, if, if we were reviewing a, a superhero, a, a big two comic, and it had this many villains in yeah. it, I mean, it would be probably the talk of the town here, uh, in, in my view. And of course, okay, we have that, I suppose, theoretically in Dark Crisis. <laughs> so but that's not- a huge, that's supposed to be the big event. Exactly. It's so it's a fun deal, you know? So yeah, but so it this does it. That's all of them. It looks like that's right, and and of course with that Sarah Meyer on the colors, I mean everything pops, man. So this is really really good, which is exactly what you want. You want bright colors. You want action. You want that on a Saturday morning. And if you're gonna have a Saturday morning cartoon, that's what you want. And this is a perfect encapsulation of that in comic book form. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And you have that cool page, like you said, Shredder in the middle, like, hey, we're going to get out of here. We have an advantage. We're just going to fight Shredder all at once. And he's like, do you? <laughs> and there's all those guys. <laughs> and you have, you know, throughout this Triceratons, you have all like even the ones that I know of right now, like they're all there. And the big ones are are definitely a Shredder, Bebop, Rocksteady, all that. But then each character that you go to is fighting another round of all these bad guys. And even if you don't know, they fit the whole idea of being a video game anyway. They all, it all fits in, it all goes in there and it's pretty cool. And I think that that's one of the plays here. If you are a fan and you have watched the cartoon and read this stuff, it can only be better. You know, it, me and you are enjoying this for what it is and fun knowing a couple of the characters. But when you get to pages where there could be people like, oh, my God, I recognize every single one of these. It, it has to be cool. This is where when we end up having, say, a dark crisis and infinite Earths or these big events when you're like, oh, my God, there's the metal men. You know, or, oh, my God, like characters that we know that you get excited because you never thought you'd see them there. I mean, we ended up with this past deal if you are a DC fan sideways shows up out of nowhere you're like oh my god sideways like i haven't seen sideways i never yeah. thought i'd see sideways again and i think that you have to get that feel in some of this if you are in the know but even without being in the know i still liked it because then they end up they end up it's a capture the flag game that they're supposed to do and the setup makes sense you go to capture the flag if you fail on a level you end up all going off to mini games this just allows them to continue the story have some fun video game references but when they do end up getting out of it it has a classic ending for what would be a saturday morning cartoon they come out oh man we did it Donatello, I got to make some adjustments here. And then April has shown up. No, Casey. I guess he's still coming with whatever. But she ends up, and I thought when she says, hey, guys, I brought those pizzas. I'm like, you have a bag there. What's up? With oh, that's because she bought a video game. That looks like <laughs> Super Mario 3. Yeah. But she ends up, here's a video game. And they're like, video games. And then I'm thinking, what is April thinking? Like, you jerks. Like, the idea that they throw a, a sword through here, it's like Raphael gets it. And they pin it to the wall like hey we we you know don't want video games she's like did i say something wrong i'm like she just <laughs> spent money on you guys you jerks but it's <laughs> such a classic end where you end up having that wah, wah, wah deal and they're all laughing and going off and then even it says next for those about to rock and i'm like all right these seem like a lot of fun little one shots that would be just the saturday morning cartoons that you would just you didn't have to worry about too much you know saturday mornings you would just go okay i'm gonna watch the turtles and then you just see what happens that day and then go on from it and you know have fun with it and i think that that's the whole idea of this which is pretty cool and i did like it uh how about you i i i really enjoyed it i was i was impressed i mean i yeah. i wasn't i mean it was it was better than what I was expecting, to be very blunt. And I was even impressed at the end. It shows up multiple covers and, and different types yeah. of art. Yeah. And we have a, a checklist for, I didn't even, I mean, my ignorance, I didn't even know there was a big event. There's actually a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle event called the Armageddon Game. And there's like a checklist of the comics to pick up of, of the probably the more adult or the more. Yeah, the there's adult, more. The, sorry, the other so deal, yep. that's actually, yeah. I didn't realize that. So maybe maybe because I do get, you know, uh, through various means uh, access to some of these uh, preview comics. Maybe I should be reading, checking yeah. out more and more turtles. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that the covers, there's even a Kevin Eastman cover. There's some pretty cool things in, in the back. And yeah, it's weird that checklist. And then I read. Like the solicit, and they're like, hey, these series of fun one shots. I'm like, well, I'll have to see how this all ties together and whatnot and how we go. But I liked it. Uh, I'm yeah. going to give it, uh, it's weird. I'm going to give it an eight again. Same kind of deal that I said with Leonide. It's what it is, but I think that most people can jump in and just enjoy it. If you wanted something that was fun, it could be something that even get, obviously, it's. Yeah. Uh, all ages and well, if you had a kid that was even interested a little in it it's not a bad way it's not going to give you all the information that you need going forward but it's fun because of the video game angle and things yeah uh, i'm gonna go higher actually i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a full nine because okay uh the reason now why i'm going so high that. is because you know i i collect a lot of uh dc animated stuff for dc animated yeah. heroes and it's it, it's it's just rare to get that much like this, this is, has everything in it. Mm -hmm. And 
everything for everybody and it's it's a one shot and it's it's starting off and i'm sure this is a series it's not a one shot yeah and yeah this is this is the art's fantastic and i mean i don't it's fun it's funny it's crazy it's i mean if and it's it knows its audience it knows its yeah. audience and i i think this so yeah i'm, I'm gonna go high yeah, I I'm gonna go eight five then. I'll go a little. <laughs> you son of a gun, make me. And the thing is, again, I was just trying to trying to get a score because of the idea. Again, it's really fun. I mean, you can't help but have fun with it. At the end, I'm like, okay, and and you, maybe some people will be like this. You have this one shot deal kind of feel. It might be enough for you. And if we didn't talk about another one. I'm good with that. If we talked about more, I'd be excited about that as well because it was so well done. In the meantime, I was kind of thinking to maybe I'm going to send it to Brandon. I'm going to get him a copy and send it to him and see what he thinks because he's a big Turtles fan of both the comics and the cartoon. So I might even have him talk about it with me a little on our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, you can podcast ask him. On Tuesday. Ask him. So, yeah, I want to see what like all these guys and see if yeah. what he thought of it. I want to see what he's going uh, with that deal. So I thought it was pretty good. And you have like the whole. You know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja, they're doing their catchphrases. And stuff. It's really fun. So, yeah, I'll go 8-8 eight, eight now. See, as you talk, I, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just convince myself to get to a 9 with you eventually. But with all that, pretty good week. Pretty good week of stuff. There was some other stuff that came out that I thought was pretty good as well, including something that we didn't realize was continuing this week, which is Minor Threats, the Pat Oswalt, Jordan Blum stuff. And I thought maybe we'll do that next week since we like that first issue enough. I mean, we actually really did like it, so I, I would do that. But even stuff like give a shout out to the Walking Dead Deluxe deal that comes out twice a month. I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, but this week's uh, issue was issue number 48 it's one of the most important and big issues of the entire series so if you haven't been checking that out i like it it's with deluxe coloring by dave mckegg and i'm going through it uh, again on a podcast but it's my first time going through and i really enjoyed that and there there were some other things uh anything that you would suggest other than uh, what we talked about yeah well and uh, i'm gonna suggest uh uh one of the uh One's, uh, sorry, it's, uh, let me see here. It's called Sweetie, uh, uh Candy yeah, Vigilante. Yeah. We, we almost, uh, ended up reviewing it and, uh, yep. but we didn't, but, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a little bit, it's, it's about kind of a pretty sexy vigilante stripper. It's crazy, but I love the artistic style and, uh, it's worth, uh, I, I think it's worth, uh, worth checking out. It's yeah, by we almost Dynamite did. And, yeah. yeah, we almost did it. And, uh. It, when I looked at it, I'm like, it reminded me of like Harley Quinn and Stripperella. Yeah. <laughs> like, like combined. And I, I paged through it and I thought it looked really fun. And it almost made the cut. It's just that we wanted to have three. We figured we'd go with the ones that we did. But that is, and it's getting, it only has two reviews, but it's getting decent reviews. But it looked like a lot of fun. It was very, very sexy. Uh, and then also another thing that I wanted me and you to go through them. Maybe we would eventually or something, or at least you can tell me if you liked it. But the Unbreakable Red Sonia has a number one also by Dynamite. It's by my man Jim Zub, which was another reason I wanted you to maybe uh, check it out. And we were even thinking about doing that on the show, but we it didn't make the cut. But that came out. I see a couple reviews saying it's pretty decent. And Image had a bunch of other three keys. Number one, they ended up having and Kea. Uh, number one, which I saw a lot of people liking, that almost made the cut as well. But we have the three books, so we did these. But I, I'm glad that we did. I had a fun time talking about these books and and whatnot. But as we do at the end, please look. If you're listening to this as a podcast, please check the show notes and go over to YouTube and see Rocky's channel over at YouTube, where one of the big things that he does. I think you're recording tonight. You told me uh, you'll be recording with JC or DC a show that is really really good. Uh, so check all that out and and obviously else? check right. out uh, weird science uh, weird science dc you guys review all dc you review Ma you review everything I, I don't think yeah. there's anything you don't review so definitely check out the weird science uh podcast and site and uh, if you uh join the patreon i'm a member of the patreon uh you get we get the distinction of being called a member of the get fresh crew it's a mm -hmm. great time yep. uh great time to, to talk comic books on the on the slack as well and it's uh i, I 
could, you know, I couldn't sing its praises enough. It it brings more joy to comic collecting when, I, when there's other people that I can rant and rave to about comics. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people don't have a lot of people to talk to. Well, yeah. when it comes to comics, uh, that there's nobody they know. Or the, I'm right with them. Yeah. My family wants no parts of me talk. I'm not allowed to talk comics or black pink in the house. <laughs> my two loves, and I'm not allowed to talk about them. But, yeah. uh, but with that, thank you, Rocky. Uh, always a pleasure. I hope everybody enjoyed the show. But you take us out. All right, uh, comic boom and weird science out. out. Thank <laughs> you.